<laughs> well, thank you for the invitation. It's a pleasure to speak here at this workshop. So I thought what I would do today is give a kind of overview talk where I tell different ways in which generalized cohomology enters into field theory. And um, so here's the outline. And there are five different kinds of parts to the talk, plus a preliminary uh, that comes before. So I think one of the first ways that generalized cohomology theories, meaning cohomology theories beyond uh, Eilenberg and McLean, enter into field theory is through the study of anomalies of spinner fields. And that happened in the 1980s. And there we encounter K-theory and various versions of K-theory and also truncations of various versions of K-theory. Uh, the next place, or in a sense simultaneously, is uh, with secondary invariants. I'll explain geometrically what that means. Those in, in field theory are often called topological terms, even though they're not perhaps by some definition, strictly speaking, topological. And again, those can go beyond eilenberg maclean cohomology to some other um, generalized cohomology theories. Another place where it enters is in the Dirac quantization of abelian gauge, um, gauge fields. And again, here the examples will be from string theory. One encounters uh, theories beyond cohomology. And the last two topics are really about invertible field theories and understanding invertible field theories themselves as a map between cohomology, uh, between spectra in the end. And there's a story for the domain, a story for the codomain, and both of those involve different sorts of generalized cohomology theories or spectra. So I'm going to illustrate these general principles with um, my own work and work of collaborators. And that's a little bit of a dark art as um, this particular practitioner of dark arts was known to hawk his own work, his own books. But um, of course, there are many people who have uh, used generalized cohomology. And um, I apologize in advance for not mentioning, of course, you've heard about some of that in some of the talks at this workshop already, and we'll hear more. Uh, one thing I don't discuss at all is the uh, program of Stoltz and Teichner and all of their work, which is in a sense in a different direction, using field theories to try to um, model a certain uh, generalized cohomology theory, topological modular forms. Uh, nor do I discuss at some point, there are alternative proposals out there involving yet different um, spectra, different cohomology theories in relation to Dirac quantization, and I won't be discussing that. So finally, let me say that even though I titled this about field theory, and I'll focus on field theory, the generalized cohomology enters the neighboring fields of both string theory and condensed matter physics. We'll see the string theory explicitly, the condensed matter won't really appear in today's talk. All right. So one preliminary I wanted to say a little bit about is the differential version of uh, cohomology theory. And that's a subject which, um, which has been extensively developed. Um, it started in a sense with the paper of Cheeger and Simons back in the 70s and um, inputs a different direction from Delenia's work in algebraic uh, geometry. But um, by now there's a nice theory, maybe not totally complete. There's actually a book that was recently written by, um, by, by some uh, uh, young people that, that studied generalized cohomology. So that's a nice source and has lots of references. And we've heard a lot about that, for example, in the talk today of Yamashita. So let me just say briefly that a few points. If we have a cohomology theory, then uh, cohomology theory is something defined on a nice category of topological spaces, for example, CW complexes or larger category. And um, so there's a notion of a differential refinement, which is not a cohomology theory at all in the traditional sense, and it's defined on smooth manifolds. So I'm not going to give any definitions. Again, this is a survey talk, but just some examples to get a feel for it. 
So if we look at ordinary eilenberg maclean cohomology in degree one, that has a nice interpretation. If I have a space M, needn't be a smooth manifold, then a class in here is a map to the circle, to R mod Z, up to homotopy. It's a homotopy class of such maps. And the differential refinement, which is defined for smooth manifolds, gives us an actual map. So in this case, the differential refinement is just this abelian group of maps. If we go to K, K theory, so here in degree zero, then in topology, we can model uh, K theory by Z2 graded vector bundles, traditionally thought of as the difference of two vector bundles, but we only know them up to isomorphism and there's even a further equivalence relation that we divide by to get this K theory group. On the other hand, this uh, differential refinement is, well, it's a group. So again, there are equivalences, but the objects here can be, again, Z2 graded vector bundles, but now equipped with some differential data, a connection or a super connection. Okay. And if we come to uh, degree two, this was degree one of the eilenberg maclean situation, HZ. In degree two, uh, in topology, we get principal R mod Z or circle bundles up to isomorphism. And in the differential theory, we get bundles with connection up to isomorphism. So there's a commutative square one often writes down, for example, in this example with uh, HZ2, if we take a bundle with, with connection, we can take its curvature, which is a differential two form that's closed. We can take its first turn class, which is a cohomology class in the ordinary cohomology. So this is the refinement map that I had on the previous slide. And these two both map into the real cohomology where they agree. If you get the i over two pi's correct, then uh, the Durham class of the curvature is, uh, represents the first term class of the bundle. But I emphasize this is not a pullback diagram in the category of abelian groups. And that's most easily seen if we take M to be the circle, because in the case of the circle, the second cohomology vanishes, every two form vanishes. Again, the second cohomology vanishes, and so we see these zeros. On the other hand, uh, if I take a circle and I take a principal R mod Z bundle, we could have holonomy around uh, that circle. And so you see, this is clearly not a pullback. This is not determined by these two, but rather it's a pullback in a more sophisticated sense, a kind of homotopy pullback where we don't pass to equivalence classes, but we take the whole theory at once. And that's related to the following remark which is that both in geometry and in the field theory, one wants objects that are local on a smooth manifold that satisfy some kind of sheaf condition. And equivalence classes usually never satisfy such a sheaf condition. So this differential cohomology group is not really sufficient to do the kind of geometry and physics one wants to do. You need the kinds of objects that you can glue together those objects fit together into groupoids or higher groupoids. And so you need to remember the internal symmetries in order to get locality. All right, so I'm talking about field theory and in the back of my mind, but it won't always be at the forefront, is the framework for field theory that comes from a T and Siegel in uh, Siegel in two-dimensional conformal field theory in the eighties and in the late eighties also uh, Tia in the topological case, but we think of that framework as applying in general. And the analogy you should think of is simply a representation of a Lie group on a vector space, or perhaps in, if it's a non-compact group, typically on a topological vector space. And uh, so if we don't want the invertible kind of analogy, we can think of modules over an algebra. So in this definition, the domain is a bordism category. And that is to say it's objects are n minus one manifolds that are closed. We have bordisms, which are compact n manifolds between them. And they're equipped with background fields. And a field is some sort of sheaf condition again, which assigns to every n manifold. So you think of a op small open set, it assigns some collection of fields. 
So that collection of fields might be a set, for example, the set of metrics on your manifold, and those pull back under local diffeomorphisms, or it might be a groupoid like connections, as on the previous slide, where we remember the automorphisms, the gauge transformations of connections. We need that again to get locality. Or it could be a higher groupoid as you meet with B fields. So the codomain is some kind of category of topological vector spaces. And a field theory then is a homomorphism from that domain to that codomain. And that's just very structurally encoding what correlation functions, state spaces, and all that are in a weak rotated field theory on curved manifolds. So I'll say there's a recent preprint. Again, this, this is most developed in the case of topological field theories and then in conformal field theories, but there is a recent preprint, maybe not so recent at this point, but still, of Konsevich and Siegel, which um, talks about these axioms for general quantum field theories. And I think the understanding is we should think about them in that context. Now, field theories are local and unitary. Those are the two pillars really of field theory. And unitarity is not in this definition, we could put it. Locality is to a limited degree. And if we want full locality, then we have to allow ourselves to have manifolds with corners all the way down so we can do higher co-dimension gluing. And again, that's developed for topological field theories to great effect. And it's uh, very much an open kind of area for general field theories. All right, so one more notion from general field theory is that of an anomalous field theory. And so there's a notion of having a boundary theory, first of all. So here I've shifted a little bit that the bulk here is an n plus one dimensional theory. And there's a notion of having a field theory on its boundary. And in fact, there's a notion of a left or a right boundary. And this picture, you might think of alpha as the analog of an algebra, and this f is the analog of a left module. So this would be a depiction of a left boundary theory. And if the bulk theory alpha is invertible, then we say that F is an anomalous theory with anomaly theory alpha. So I think that definition has been certainly used in the previous talks. And one kind of refinement of that definition or one more honest definition is that if we're focused on N dimensions and really focused on this anomalous field theory, then we don't need an N plus one dimensional theory in the bulk. We don't need to evaluate it on some kind of curved n plus one manifold that doesn't have a boundary that has nothing to do with the f. And so there's a notion of, of what I would call a once categorified n-dimensional theory that is kind of a n plus one dimensional theory without the top level. And so, uh, for example, Stoltz and Teichner have that notion they call twistings. And um, that's really what you need. In, in the bulk. And so in particular for an anomalous field theory, that's what one should have. But in the examples that I'll say, it's there are natural extensions to a full n plus one dimensional theory. And I'll just talk about that n plus one dimensional theory. And, there, and then the notion of the boundary theory. Okay, well, anomalies are very useful and um, you can often put more background fields. For example, if you have a symmetry, what it really means is you can couple to a background um, gauge field is the word in physics for that symmetry. And um, that can often lead to anomalies. Or if you have a constant, like a coupling constant in the theory or a mass or something like that, you can let that be a function, a scalar function. And that sometimes uh, introduces anomalies. And if you study your theory over a bigger base, which means more background fields, then you're going to learn more about your theory. The same in geometry. If you study over a bigger base, that's essentially more symmetries, then you're going to learn more about the, the theory. All right, so those are the preliminaries. And now I wanna get on to spinner fields um, and how the K theory and its cousins enter via the index theorem. Again, just 
kind of high level survey. So first, what is a spinner field? Well, the theory of a spinner field starts in Minkowski space time. So here's Minkowski space time. And um, that's an affine space. It's got translations acting on it. And it has a translationally invariant Lorentz signature metric. And therefore it has null vectors, which are these red light cones. And there's one more piece of structure, which is a time orientation. You, you have to give a direction, one of the components of the time-like vectors, there are two components and you choose one of them, which is a positive direction in time or duly a notion of positive energy, which is what one needs to do the wick rotation. So what's the data one needs for a spinner field? Well, you need, first of all, uh, the vector space where the spinners lie. And that's a real spinner representation of the Lorentz group. And spinner representation means that it extends to a module over the even Clifford algebra of the appropriate signature for Lorentz uh, geometry. So this is an ungraded Clifford module. Now there's a miracle about Lorentz signature that's unique to Lorentz signature, which is given any such real spinner representation, there always exists a symmetric pairing from that spinner representation back to the translations. And furthermore, you can arrange that that pairing is positive definite, meaning that on the diagonal, if I take the square of a spinner under this representation, I get into the closure of the positive time-like vectors. So we use that orientation of time. So that's the theorem. It's a kind of miracle about Lorentz signature. And um, the, the set of the space of these pairings is, a con is contractible. So it doesn't have any topological kind of information, but it is important in writing down the kinetic term, for example, of a spinner field. And then there might be a mass. <clears throat> the mass might be zero, so there is a mass. And the mass is a skew symmetric invariant bilinear form that takes values now in the reals. So this gamma takes values in the vector space of translations, the mass is real value. And in fact, there's a nice algebraic lemma uh, that tells you about these masses when they're non-degenerate. So as I say, zero is always a possibility, but the interesting question is, are there non-degenerate masses? And what happens with this gamma is that there's a dual gamma that makes S plus its dual into a Z, now a graded, a Z2 graded module over the same Clifford algebra. So we started with this ungraded real representation. We get um, this uh, Z2 graded one. And saying there's a non-degenerate mass is having an additional Clifford generator. So those are equivalent. And in the theory of Clifford modules, a la Tia Bot Shapiro, having that extra Clifford generator is trivializing in the K-theory group of the Clifford modules. It's, it's trivializing the module. So that resonates, I think, with how you might think about a mass, certainly in relation to anomalies. Okay, so we can ask, this should define a spinner field, a, a free field theory. That's a quantum field theory, nothing topological, invertible, or anything about it. But it's anomalous, it should have an anomaly attached to it. And so we could ask for that, what is the anomaly theory? That's something that might be useful in studying the spinner field and particularly studying the spinner field as it appears in much more complicated theories. So at the end of the lecture, when we have a little more on the table, I'll answer that question. But traditionally, one approached this anomaly through the um, partition function. And so if we have n-dimensional manifolds, which are the top dimension in the spinner field, then, so n is the space-time dimension I might not have said it before. So here we have a family of n-dimensional manifolds, which have a spin structure and a Riemannian structure on which then this, um, these spinner fields are defined. One can define then a family of Dirac operators. We use this data and Lorentz signature to define these Dirac operators in the Wick rotated theory and therefore in Riemannian signature. So that's a little construction to make those Dirac operators in this generality. And then if you formally do the functional integral, it's a free theory, it's quadratic, what you get is the Pfaffian of the Dirac operator. And that's naturally a section of a, a line bundle. So there's a Pfaffian line bundle. And 
that's depicted here in red. And the, um, and the partition function is uh, a section of that bundle. So it might in particular vanish at some point. So that's part of this picture of an anomaly where this Pafian line is the state space in n dimensions of an n plus one dimensional theory. And this is a boundary theory, an anomalous theory, which in dimension n gives us a section of this bundle. So that. Okay, so this Pafian bundle also carries geometry, it carries a metric constructed by Quillen and a covariant derivative that Bismuth and I constructed in general. And the theorem here is that the isomorphism class of this Pafian bundle, nothing to do with the section, but of the bundle is computed by a push forward in KO theory. And so that's why K theory enters, it's because of the index theorem. And if we just ask about the bundle up to uh, isomorphism as bundles without any geometry, then it's topological KO theory. And that's the theorem of the T and Singer. If we ask about the bundle with its geometry, with its covariant derivative, then we need to compute something not in H2, which is the line bundle, but in differential H2. In fact, slightly better because it's naturally a Z2 graded line bundle. So a little bit more. And uh, there's a theorem of John Lott and myself, which proves a version of that kind of index theorem, giving the isomorphism class. Uh, we did complex K theory, but um, one should be able to refine that to the real case. Okay, so as I said, this Pafian line bundle is part of a whole invertible field theory. The partition function of that field theory is an exponentiated eight invariant. And that's what you have on a closed um, n plus one manifold on a manifold with boundary. That eight invariant is naturally an element in the Pafian line of the boundary. It satisfies gluing properties and so on to make together an invertible field theory, something I worked out with um, Shinze Dai. And so that's the kind of top part of this anomaly theory. And later I'll give a formula in terms of differential KO theory. So not in terms of analytic constructions from Dirac operators, but in terms of the topological side, sort of implicitly applying a very strong index theorem, but just say what the answer is in differential KO theory. But I wanna point out that in um, many circumstances, you don't need the entire KO theory, which has lots of homotopy groups. You can get by with truncations. And I'll just quote some theorems that, um, that tell you that. And that's useful because if that occurs as part of a larger physical theory, then you might actually use that truncation to cancel the anomaly against something happening elsewhere in the theory that involves this truncation of the of KO theory. So for example, if we look at um, supersymmetric quantum mechanics, so that's maps from a one-dimensional manifold into a target Riemannian manifold, then, um, well, if you're studying that on the circle, you'll encounter the family of Dirac operators parameterized by the loop space. So this is the free loop space of maps from the circle into M. And if we assume that M is both even dimensional and oriented, then this um, Pfaffian line bundle has a very easy formula. So in fact, the Pfaffian line bundle in this case is real and it has a flat structure. So it's determined just by an element of H1 with Z mod two coefficients. So we don't need all of KO theory to write down the formula for it. In fact, it just ends up being the transgression of the second Stiefel Whitney class. So here the formula is just in terms of eilenberg maclean cohomology. Okay, and we can get the entire invertible field theory that way. But now supposing we drop the assumption that M is even dimensional oriented, we consider the supersymmetric uh, sigma model into one dimensional sigma model into a general uh, manifold M. Well, then we need more of KO theory, but we need just the truncation that keeps these homotopy groups, this piece of the box song. And that truncation is actually a ring theory. It's a multiplicative theory, ring spectrum. And um, well, so it turns out you can express the anomaly theory, the full two-dimensional anomaly theory in terms of this R 
And here I've written for you the formula for the partition function. So this is an invertible two-dimensional theory that um, is topological. It's of order two. The partition function is plus or minus one. And uh, it's defined on spin manifolds together with a map to this target M. And then we get some kind of formula there. So let me tell you one more index theorem of this type in low dimensions. And here we take a further truncation. So this is a truncation of KO or even a truncation of R. Let's call it E. And it just keeps these two homotopy groups. So it has, you know, in a sense, three of them because they're spaced out. And there's a non-trivial K invariant that uh, links them. It's not a product of eilenberg maclean's but it's a twisted product. It's an extension. And in this extension, because of the Z mod two, you get some additional divisibility that you don't get inside um, eilenberg maclean So for example, for SUN bundles, there's a characteristic class, the third churn class. And inside this theory E, there's a characteristic class, which is um, half of it. In other words, twice this lies in ordinary HZ and is the third churn class. So if you imagine that we now are in four dimensions, so not that low, and we have a family of manifolds again, closed Riemannian manifolds, and we have a vector bundle over it with structure group SUN. So it has a trivialization of its determinant line bundle, in other words. And now we can look at the family of Dirac operators. The natural thing here is the determinant of the uh, Dirac operator. And that makes a line bundle again over um, this base space S. And we could ask for the formula for its, um, for, for the uh, isomorphism class of that line bundle. And again, it's naturally a Z2 graded line bundle. And the isomorphism class lives in this E theory because this E theory in that degree is giving you line bundles, that's the H2 with Z coefficients, but there's an H naught with Z2 coefficients, which also gives you the grading. So this exactly gives you Z2 graded line bundles. And the formula is that you simply integrate over these four manifolds, over the fibers of that vibration, you integrate um, this half second churn class. So if you integrate that in this uh, E theory, that's what you get. And again, the differential version gives you the determinant line bundle with its uh, geometry, with its connection. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm confused. Uh, so isn't K01 Z mod two? Uh, let's, I'm confused oh. about. Uh, sorry, yes, I wrote that wrong. Yes, sorry. It's, uh, thank you. Yeah, it, sorry, it's, uh, that's absolutely wrong, yes. <laughs> So, um, so the the truncation is yeah okay, but it's like a it's a two state of well there are two non-trivial homotopy groups and they're connected by that k invariant. Yes, yeah, so that part is correct. <laughs> okay. And um, perhaps what I should say is if we take the um, the Anderson dual of this theory, then it's uh, co-connected. It has pi naught z and pi minus one z mod two. And those two are um, maybe better seen, uh, seen as the truncation. Anyway, sorry. Yes, you're absolutely right to point that out. Um, right, OK. OK, yes. Thank you. But yes, if I don't think of it as a truncation of KO, I could just tell you this and this, and that specifies the yes. group extension there. So that's what I mean. Thank you for catching that. OK. So now let's move on to the second way in which um, exotic or uh, generalized cohomology theories appear in field theory, and that's through secondary invariance. So let me say something about secondary invariance in a particular case. There are other kinds of secondary invariance in geometry, and this is in the case of um, the theory of connections, so both primary and secondary invariance. So the data we want to start with is a Lie group. And um, well, for the connection with topology, we need uh, to assume it has finitely many components. It's not a countable discrete group, for example. 
but it could be a finite group. And um, we start with a, a P linear form on the Lie algebra, which is symmetric and invariant under the adjoint representation of the group on its Lie algebra. So now this is well known that every time you have a principal bundle with connection, so a principal G bundle with a connection, the connection is a form, a differential form on the total space of this bundle pi. And it's a, it's a one form with values in the Lie algebra. And so we can form the curvature by this expression, which is a two form with values in the Lie algebra. And then we can take and take P copies of the curvature. We can simultaneously wedge them together and apply this multilinear form. And so what we get is a scalar form of degree two P up on the total space P. And the little lemma that follows easily from the Bianchi identity is that that's a closed form. So that's what's called the churn ve form. So how do we get a primary invariant? Well, we have to know that this form actually descends to the base. So it's a form that initially lives on P, but it actually is the pullback of a form on M. And once we know that, if the base happens to be the same dimension as the degree of the form and it's closed and oriented, then we can integrate. And this is the primary invariant. So that's a real number. And um, that invariant ends up being independent of the connection. It just depends on the topology of the bundle. Okay. But if we want an integer invariant, then um, we have to make some hypotheses that uh, lead to the conclusion that this invariant actually lives in the integers. And so that's some integrality hypothesis on, um, on this form. So these forms uh, comprise a vector space, a finite dimensional real vector space. It's the p -th symmetric power of the dual of the Lie algebra. And then we take the invariance under the action of G on that vector space. And inside that vector space, there is, well, there are many different kinds of lattices we can give, as I'll say. But we have to give some lattice that makes this true. And once we have that, so this integrality hypothesis, then we can define a secondary invariant, which depends on the connection. It's a geometric invariant. It's defined for 2p minus 1 manifolds that are closed, but only those which bound a compact um, 2p manifold, which is again oriented. And um, yeah, so, so in that case, we can get an invariant. So I should say it's for these manifolds, of course, together with a connection. And the connection has to extend, which is a topological question of whether the bundle itself extends. But if we want an invariant that's defined on all 2p minus 1 manifolds, and we want it to be local, then we need additional data. And that additional data will be enough to say that this secondary invariant, geometric invariant, is actually the partition function of an invertible field theory. And saying it's the partition function of a fully extended invertible field theory is the strong statement of locality. So here again is our principal bundle. And we have a connection, which remembers a one form uh, with values in the Lie algebra. We have its curvature. It's a two form with values in the Lie algebra. We have the 2p form, which is scalar, which is the churn ve form. And I guess I didn't introduce the definition in this talk. We have a 2p minus one scalar form, which is the churn simons form. And now let's think about the descent of all these things to the base. Well, the, cur the easiest one is this churn ve form. It's simply the pullback of a scalar form on the base, M. The curvature also descends to the base, but the curvature upstairs is vector valued in this fixed vector space, the Lie algebra. Downstairs, it takes values in a vector bundle that twists the adjoint bundle. So those descend to differential forms on M. And the connection descends too, but it doesn't descend to a differential form. It doesn't descend to one form. It descends to um, a section of some affine bundle over M, a bundle of affine spaces that you can make from the uh, principal bundle. 
So in a sense, the connection descends, although it doesn't descend as a form, so we usually say it doesn't descend. But what about this chern simons form? That's where the secondary invariant comes. And we have to take integrality and then some additional choice, and then we can descend this, but not again as a differential form or a section of some simple bundle, but rather as a, as a differential co-cycle. So again, I don't just want a class, I want an actual co-cycle or some representative, and we can descend, we can choose it to be in some generalized theory. So here again is where generalized cohomology theories that provide the integrality we need for the secondary invariant, that's where they enter. So the traditional choice is to take um, eilenberg maclean cohomology. And so this differential, this vector space I talked about is actually this vector space. It has an interpretation in terms of real cohomology. And one way to get a full lattice in there is to take the image of integral cohomology. That gives us the integrality condition on the previous slide. But to do this descent and define the secondary invariant everywhere, we need to choose a cohomology class here. So for example, in three-dimensional Chern-Simons theory that one considers, one starts with a class in H4 with coefficients in Z, the traditional level. Okay, but we could put other cohomology theories here that also give us a full lattice in there by putting in some torsion groups. Okay, now how does this enter field theory? Well, in field theory, if you open up a traditional book on field theory, they'll say, what do you do? You define a set of fields. That's what I talked about earlier, but here in usually in Lorentz signature, Minkowski space time, you tell a symmetry group, and now you write down all expressions in those fields, but up to a certain order, number of derivatives say, which are invariant under the symmetry. And that makes the Lagrangian of the theory. And those expressions are typically, um, well, the, the Lagrangian is a density. It's a density on, on uh, the space time. And then the action you write is the integral of a density. So traditionally, this didn't allow for terms like chern simons And of course, it was discovered that those enter in lots of ways. And so what we look for now is an invertible field theory built from the fields. That's what we would replace this traditional point of view with. And that would then include these secondary invariants, like these turn simons invariants, which originally, I should say, Jacques and others were the ones who really um, put their finger on the role of those, uh, those terms early on in field theory. Okay. So this is, as I say, a second way in which generalized cohomology theories enter into field theory. The first one I explained was from the anomalies of spinner fields. Okay, so let me give two examples. Uh, with this uh, theory E that I talked about before. Okay. So one is spin churn simons So as I said, in usual churn simons three-dimensional churn simons theory, one takes a level, which is a class in this cohomology group, but maybe refined to a co-cycle there. And a spin level is in this theory E. And those are related because we said that this E has two homotopy groups, one Z, one Z mod two, and they're separated by two but we don't get a product. This group is not the product of these two groups, but rather there's an extension and the extension I told you is given by this class. And so those together mean that there's a long exact sequence, but in particular a map from the levels to the spin levels. And so you can see that, um, that levels in particular map to sit inside the spin levels. So if I take the circle group, for example, then uh, it turns out that the levels are an infinite cyclic group, but the generators don't line up. In other words, in the spin theory, we get, so to speak, twice as many levels. We have an additional integrality. And of course, that's well known in the in turn Simons theory. And um, a while ago, Jerry Jenkin developed this point of view and said some things about uh, turn Simons theory using also eight invariants of real Dirac operators uh, to model some of them. 
Okay, second story is to do with something that is close to real physics, I think, which um, not this refinement, but at least the theory is, which is to say it's four-dimensional QCD, um, which is a four-dimensional theory that has uh, a gauge group, it has spinner fields and so on. And it has a global symmetry group, which is the product of the Lie group with itself, namely SUN. Flavors is what the F is. And at low energy, this theory is approximated by a sigma model into this homogeneous space, which is a way of presenting the group with its left and right multiplication symmetry. So that's called the model of pions. That's very traditional in quantum field theory. And Wes and Zemino introduced, they, they examined this from the kind of ad hooked point of view, saying that you should be able to match the anomaly in the high energy theory and the low energy theory. And they were working with local anomaly and they introduced background gauge fields where you get the anomaly. So that's an example of spreading the theory out over a bigger base, more background fields to learn more about the theory. And so they deduced a West Zemino term in the Sigma model. Now Witten looked at that subsequently and he looked at it on S4 and he uh, gave a kind of quantization and integrality to that term, but he used integer cohomology. And the way he was able to do it by detailed calculation of the kinds of factors that occur was that he was studying on S4 and he used a funny fact, which is that the Hravich map from homotopy to, um, to homology in that degree has a factor of two. So here N is at least three, capital N. So he used that extra two to be able to express what he wanted here, and the fact that he was only studying on the four sphere. But that leaves several mysteries that don't really match the whole story. So one thing is that the high energy theory requires a spin structure, and this low energy theory, as stated here, doesn't. You can have this secondary term, this West Amino term, and if you're in here, you just need an orientation to define it. So matching the kinds of background fields from the high energy to the low energy is, if you like, a variation of the Hooft anomaly matching, and there should be a matching there. Another um, related uh, mismatch is that the QCD has fermionic states, but this pion model doesn't obviously have uh, fermionic states in the way that it's uh, presented. Okay, another one is Wesson's Mino matched the anomaly over the reals, meaning the local anomaly, but we could ask about the more precise anomaly. And finally, there's a funny business when uh, it's SU2, because in SU2, we don't have any degree five homology, and yet there should be a story also for SU2. So anyway, a solution to these problems uh, I wrote about a while ago is to use this generalized cohomology theory E, this two-stage uh, system, instead of integer cohomology. So this gains you a factor of two now for this secondary term, which really comes from this fifth cohomology. You see that sits in the E cohomology again with a factor of two, just as the previous exact sequence. So we can divide by two. In other words, the generator here will get us an extra factor of two. And one thing you note right away is for n equals two, this group comes into play for SU2. And so this class, this generator is non-zero even for n equals two. And so now we use this E theory to quantize this WZW term. So we write it, if we have the sigma model, we have a map of our four manifold into the group, we pull this back in the differential version of E theory, we integrate it and that's our secondary invariant. And that solves all of these problems simultaneously. So we need a spin structure to do a push forward in this theory. This theory is not in the way I said, but nonetheless related to KO theory, it's a module over some truncation and, um, and, and that needs a spin structure as you can, can check. Um, when you go to compute on a three manifold, you'll hit the extra Z mod two there. And that will tell you that the, when you quantize that the vector spaces you get are naturally Z two graded. 
So of course that was known, the solitonic states uh, could be bosonic or fermionic, but here you see it in a more fundamental formulation. And now for the anomaly theory, I told you this four dimensional index theory using the E theory and the SUN groups, and that's exactly what you need to match this, um, this uh, West Zemino term. So you see why these truncated index theories enter then not just in a theory with spinner fields, but when you're trying to match with other things, then it's matching the secondary invariant. All right, so let me go on then to the third way in which generalized cohomology enters into uh, field theory, and that is with abelian gauge fields. So abelian gauge fields have a Dirac quantization, and how does that look? Well, if we study Maxwell theory in, um, in physical Minkowski spacetime, flat Minkowski spacetime, then the characters that enter that plot are the electromagnetic field, which is a two form, the uh, magnetic current and the electric current. So this is a purely classical picture so far. And that's it. And both of these currents are uh, closed. That's the conservation law. And they have compact support along any spatial slice. Now Durant gives an argument that says that if you look at these um, currents, they're closed, they have a Durham class. Of course, their Durham class is zero in the cohomology of M4, but this compact support condition means that it has a non-zero, potentially a Durham cohomology class in cohomology with compact spatial supports. So that's here. And that vector space is one dimensional, that's the red line depicted. And um, Dirac charge quantization says that the, the charges, which are the cohomology classes, should be quantized in some fundamental units. And so they should lie in some integer lattice there. So how do we impose this Dirac charge quantization in a model that you would think of as a semi-classical model, a kind of input into the quantum theory? So in the classical theory, we don't have this charge quantization and this picture in terms of differential forms suffices. But in the quantum theory, we want something else. So we want to impose this integrality and yet we have to impose it locally. So a current has local information. It tells you where the charges are after all, that's local information, but it also is supposed to contain this integrality. And precisely um, differential, cohomology, but again, I emphasize it's the differential co-cycles that are local. They give you that marriage of locality and integrality. That's exactly the right tool, uh, the right uh, framework in which to model those two things simultaneously. So if we remember this square, then the um, forms here, which are closed, those are the currents that have the local information about where everything is. And the, um, the charges are these cohomology classes which live in integer cohomology. And so you see these map to the same thing here. That's the statement that the charge over the reals is the Durham cohomology class of the current. And so it's natural to say that we should lift to here. So again, in the refined model that you're feeding into the quantum theory, these currents are co-cycles for this differential cohomology group. Again, with the compact spatial support, but then we wick rotate, we do it on a closed manifold with interesting topology. And then of course, there's more interest here. So I've said that. But this principle of quantization allows that you use not just eilenberg maclean but a generalized differential cohomology theory. And um, I think the reflex for a long time is to use eilenberg maclean because you know, we like to use things we know we're familiar with. But as I say, the argument that things are quantized really doesn't tell you how they're quantized. That combined with locality tells you something. But I think the something it tells you is that you should be in a generalized differential cohomology. So that raises the question, how do you know which one to choose? in a given theory, in a given situation where you have an abelian gauge field? Well, I think the constraints on that are, you usually know which differential forms appear. 
you usually know over the reals, you can make local calculations, perturbative calculations, et cetera. So in string theory, you look at the effect of field theory, supergravity, you know which differential forms appear. So that of course is a constraint that has to match whatever you're saying with the cohomology theory. But that doesn't fix the torsion in the cohomology theory. That's just fixing the rational information. But you might also have anomaly cancellation and anomaly cancellation can um, interact with these abelian gauge fields and the way they interact and the fact that the anomaly is expressed in terms of K-theory or one of those truncations can uh, inform your choice of which generalized cohomology theory to use for this Dirac quantization. There might be solitonic objects in the theory, uh, charged objects under these abelian gauge fields, and if you put torsion into the choice of the cohomology theory, that will predict, in a sense, more solid, you know, solitonic objects with that kind of torsion. And then there might be special geometric features of your particular theory that can also guide this choice. So I've talked about the currents and quantizing the currents, but once you do that, then the gauge field itself, which is one degree lower, is also naturally presented like this. If you want to write down the theory, you'll see immediately that you need the gauge field also to be uh, a co-cycle for some differential cohomology. So I want to give several examples that mostly go beyond integer cohomology, but some of these examples involve the idea of self-duality. And in self-duality, um, there's uh, some situations where you have an isomorphism between magnetic and electric currents. And so you could ask for a single current. And in that situation, you have to give some additional data, some quadratic refinement of a symmetric bilinear pairing. All right. So these exotic examples come from string theory. And the first example I, I say is the type one superstring, where there's a four form current. And usually that's thought to be it. So that's the current attached to the B field in type one, which is locally a two form. But together they make up, uh, sorry, you, you can get a dual current, which is an eight form. So one of them is magnetic, one's electric. But in fact, uh, there's only a single self dual current. But that self dual current is, should be taken to be quantized in KO theory. And um, in that case, you get this quadratic form. There's a natural quadratic form one has to introduce. And when you do it, then uh, the center of that form is an important um, computation you make in the theory. And in fact, uh, twice the center is a natural kind of construction in KO theory of a, a version of a Wu class. And that, that class ends up being the key to understanding this Green-Schwartz anomaly cancellation over the integers instead of just uh, rationally. Okay, that type two is really an orientifold version of the type one, I mean, is an orientifold version of type two. That type two theory that the Ramon-Ramon currents are quantized by K-theory is something that um, was uh, discovered by Morin Manazian and then uh, Sen, and then Witten was the one who kind of stated Put, put those, those works together. And um, so this KO theory here is really understood to be a case of that. Now the B field um, in bosonic string theory, that's just standard HZ, but the B field in type two superstring is actually a richer object. And together with uh, Disler and Moore, we proposed that the, um, that this one is quantized in this truncation that we met before, this theory R, this multiplicative theory. So the current has degree zero in that theory. And um, that fits, again, I said there were these various things that it would fit. And in this case, it's a very tightly constrained system. And this fits a lot of things, including anomaly cancellation. By the way, here's a puzzle for you in that story which um, is not so apparent, but it's related to the puzzle I said about the pion theory. So in the string theory, 
if you look at the world sheet theory, there's a spin structure, of course, on the world sheet. If you look in the um, effective field theories, there's a spin structure on the target, on the space time. And my question is, what is the role of that spin structure on space time in the world sheet theory? See, it should have some role, again, thinking about matching. So that's a question that um, you might ponder. Okay, so this quantization again is a local statement. That's how we've put together integrality and locality to make, um, to, to use this generalized cohomology theory. But since it's local, you can imagine that globally you might have some twisting, that locally the cohomology theory is constant, so to speak, but the cohomology theory itself, the spectrum can twist over space time. So one place that occurs is in orientifolds of type two, where this B field now quantized in the theory I told you, those are exactly uh, geometric twistings of K theory. And that's how it looks in, in that theory. And in M theory is another case where there's a four form uh, magnetic current in that case. And that's in the end quantized just by ordinary integer cohomology is the accepted version. But it is twisted by the orientation double cover. That's the statement G changes sign under orientation reversal. And in that case, there's also a background magnetic current, which um, comes from the geometry. So that can happen. Well, I'm running near the end, I see. Um, where's my boss here? Do he disappeared. Well, I'll keep going till he reappears. So the remaining comments are about invertible field theories. I have maybe 10 minutes worth of such comments, but do it's up to you whether I cut off or I go for 10 more minutes. I, I think it's fine, so. Um... Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so let me talk a little bit about invertible theories because that's another way. And I think this way has been covered uh, quite a bit in this, in this conference, so I'll say a little less about it, but um, so a, a field theory is a map like this. Again, the topological case is the most developed and saying it's invertible is saying that it factors through invertible objects in the codomain. So the invertible objects are go by that name, but it means, for example, that the state spaces you attach in codimension one to an N minus one manifold <clears throat> those vector spaces should be one dimensional and so on and so forth. And so that's telling you where the theory factors. So alpha is invertible if it factors through that. And if alpha factors through that, then it also factors through the quotient. So in the codomain, we get a sub. In the domain, we get a quotient. That quotient is that I forcibly invert all of the uh, elements here. So that's a localization process in ring theory, for example, where you uh, invert. And um, so you get some completion of the domain. Well, the domain is boardism. So we ought to be able to know what this is. So these objects are Picard groupoids, kind of infinity or higher Picard groupoids, and they're equivalent then to infinite uh, loop spaces. And so in the end, this theory becomes an infinite loop map. That's the symmetric monoidal uh, character of alpha it means that this maps an infinite loop map between infinite loop spaces. And so you see that an invertible field theory can be modeled as a map of spectra whose zero spaces are these invertible, uh, are these infinite loop spaces. So that's something that um, Hopkins and Telemann and I have been uh, banding about for I don't know, 15 to 20 years, I suppose. Uh, we wrote about it first in a um, paper uh, for Nigel Hitchens' 60th birthday, where we applied it to a problem about orienting moduli spaces, in fact. Okay, so what is the domain spectrum? Well, if we uh, restrict now to topological theories, and so our background fields are topological, then in Bordism theory, as was introduced in, I think, the 60s by uh, Dick Lashoff, one models it by having a topological space mapping to B-O-N or B-G-L-N-R, if you like. 
So you could think of BSON, that would model orientations, B spin N, that would model spin structures. <coughs> you can take BON cross BK for some Lie group K that would model manifolds with a K bundle, K gauge theory, and so on and so forth. So, um, so that's the tangential structure. And now the theorem is that if we do this geometric realization, in other words, we take the quotient um, that I said in this diagram that we ought to know, this is the domain of the extended field theory. If we do that, then we get a known spectrum. And that spectrum goes by the name of Madsen-Tillman spectrum, was introduced by the two of them. And uh, I forgot to write the names. These are various names of um, people that prove various versions of this theorem. Now, there's also a notion of a stable tangential structure. So this is a tangential structure tied to a degree. For example, you might have an N framing on an N manifold that's tied to the dimension N. But we could have a stable structure, like an orientation or a spin structure, in which case it's really a space that lives over the co-limit as you take N to infinity of these spaces, and that's called BO. And so you get a sequence of these Madsen-Tillman spectrums and their co-limit is uh, the more traditional Tom spectrum. So this is the spectra, spectrum that in uh, equivalent words, Rene Tom introduced in his 1954 thesis to calculate Bordism, which in turn was you know, introduced earlier by Bontriagan and ultimately Poincaré. So we get these, um, these uh, Tom spectra as well. And we say that a theory is stable if it factors through here. And it ends up that um, having a, a version of unitarity, kind of fully local version of unitarity for these, uh, for these uh, invertible theories ends up meaning that the theory factors through this uh, MTX, something Mike Hopkins and I proved. Uh, Okay, so these are different kinds of generalized cohomology theories. These bordisms are different than the ones we've seen previously enter field theory. And now the codomain of an invertible field theory is also um, something. Well, here we don't really know what a universal good choice for a codomain is for a general field theory, if it's extended. We don't even know that if it's topological and extended. But in the invertible case, we don't need that. We only need this infinite loop space. And so we can choose that infinite loop space. Um, yeah. And so what's the thing that we choose? Well, if we look at the sphere spectrum, then the sphere spectrum is characterized by that universal property. That's the definition of a homotopy group, a map from the um, S naught into X, I should have said up to homotopy, is, um, is uh, an element of pi naught of X. Well, dually, um, again, these are all up to homotopy. Dually, um, there's a spectrum, which we get by taking HOM, so to speak, into C star. That produces a spectrum from the sphere spectrum. That's called the dual character dual, whatever dual to the sphere spectrum. And that spectrum is characterized by uh, you know, a consequent uh, universal property. It says that if we map into the nth suspension of that spectrum, then that's the same as a uh, character on the nth homotopy group of your domain. And now if you take the domain to be a bordism spectrum, whether it be Madsen-Tillman or Tom, then what you're getting here is a character on this enthomotopy group, which is the bordism group. And so it says, given a character of the bordism group, whether it be the one associated to Madsen-Tillman or the Tom traditional bordism group, then you get a map of these spectra and that's then up to homotopy. And that's then an isomorphism class of invertible theories, invertible topological field theories. So in other words, this universal property is saying that with this choice of codomain, we could have made other choices, but with this choice, an invertible field theory is determined by its partition function because this, if 
functional here is the partition function, which in this case happens to be then a bordism invariant. So that's very special to invertible theories. And the fact that that determines the theory is special to invertible theories with this choice of codomain. Now there's some magic that it's a nice property to say the partition function determines a theory. That's not true for every quantum field theory, certainly, but it is a kind of desirable property. And in this case, that property, that universal property, as I said, characterizes this spectrum, this choice of generalized cohomology theory. And immediately you find from the duals of the homotopy groups of the sphere that what you calculate for in codimension one is not a vector space, which is invertible, so a line, but a Z2 graded line. That's the Z2, the class eta in the uh, sphere spectrum dualized. And in codimension two, well, you could think of this as an algebra or as a, as a category, but that category has an additional Z mod two, which is again, pi two of the sphere or pi minus two of this IC star. And so you're reproducing some known kinds of ideas in physics, bosons and fermions, just from the sphere spectrum in this invertible case. And that's a kind of bit of magic that you might not have uh, you know, been justified to expect. Of course, that leads to the question, what about the next homotopy group? The next homotopy group is Z mod 24. And you might think that has something to do with surface operators. Okay. So if we go away from topological theories, but we go to differential, uh, to theories that are invertible, but not topological. And we've seen lots of examples of those, even this morning in Yamashita's talk, then um, the right language for that would be in terms of the differential uh, spectra or differential generalized cohomology theories. And in fact, the first conference at the uh, Simon Center in Stony Brook, some more than 10 years ago, was on differential cohomology. And Graham Siegel said in his talk, I think what, um, what was uh, you know, clear is that a diff you know, the differential cohomology should be in some sense equivalent to having an invertible field theory, that a differential cohomology class should be an isomorphism class of invertible field theories. And um, that's undoubtedly true. There's probably enough technology to pr prove that. I don't know that it's uh, ever been quite proved. All right, so let me close by uh, giving you the formula I promised you, which is now that we have a language and a little more talk about invertible field theories. Remember anomaly theories are invertible field theories. And I asked what is the anomaly theory of a spinner field in terms of this basic data that defines the spinner field. And um, again, this has to be a conjecture. First of all, it involves differential version. Sometimes this anomaly is topological, but often it's not. So the differential form that lies behind this, what I think physicists call the anomaly polynomial might be non-zero. And um, so again, we need that theory, but we also, if we wanna say this is the anomaly theory, we should really give a full construction of the spinner uh, theory, the free spinner theory of a spinner field, quantum field theory with this anomaly. So that's why I wrote conjecture. Um, in any case, I'm giving it to you with the mass being zero. And for the mass zero, um, well, it's a map from this Tom spectrum, again, the differential refinement really, but just for spin manifolds, we could make lots of variations of this formula if there are other kinds of background fields. And it goes to this universal target, again, in the differential case. And the map is constructed from this data. This remember is a contractible choice, so it doesn't enter into this formula. And what is it? Well, first we have to get from spin boardism to K theory. And that's really uh, what Atiyah, Bott, and Shapiro explained in their paper. It's really the symbol of the Dirac operator or the Tom class in KO theory that is this map phi. Then we have a class of this data. As I said, this S plus S star becomes a module over Clifford algebra that gives us an element in some KO group. That's again, part of Atiyah, Bott, and Shapiro. Then we just multiply out in KO theory. And finally, the anomaly isn't the entire 
KO theory, this, this, this map would be the index really of family of Dirac operators, but we only want the Fafian line bundle. And that Fafian uh, promotes to a transformation of these generalized cohomology theories. So in the end, we get an invertible field theory, again, the differential version. And um, there's also another similar formula if we include the mass that appears at the end of a paper joint with those authors. And um, of course, the mass, if it's non-degenerate, trivializes the anomaly. And so really that formula is in a relative uh, version of the theory where uh, the class is trivialized, uh, where the mass is non-degenerate. Okay, so thank you for listening. Thank you for the overtime and I'll stop there.